Ephesians 1, says, For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him the name as head over all things to the church, which is his body, to the fullness of him who fills all and in all. Let's stand and sing of this great holy God that we worship and serve. Holy, holy, holy.
to see you this morning. Hopefully you've had a chance to grab the sermon outline we've got at the resource table. If you, if you need one, let me know and we can get some sent to you. But that will be where we'll be working out of this morning. So last Sunday, we studied James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. And we were challenged for four different things. We were challenged to look up and be calm as we patiently endure hardship. <laughs> Amen to that, right? And then that we should look in and be clean as we strengthen or prop our hearts up and avoid grumbling because Christ the judge can return at any time. And we say, even so, Lord Jesus, quickly come. And then we should look back and be challenged as we look to the prophets and to Job as our examples of patient endurance. And then lastly, we were to look forward and be consistent as we cultivate a heart and mind that speaks and lives the truth. Those were the challenges of last Sunday. And today we close out our series in James by looking at what he has to say in chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And in those verses, he underscores the importance of prayer, confession, and restoration. So let's begin by reading the close of this passage of this excellent letter of James. And he says in verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Oh, there's power in the word of God. Amen. He begins in verses 13 and 14 by underscoring the importance of a God word and God dependent life brings all of one's cares to him. A God word and God dependent life. James talks that life situations, they bring us pressure, pleasure, and pain. There's my P's again as we began the year. But pressure, pleasure, and pain. I love how pragmatic James is with his examples. And he gives three in verses 13 and 14. Remember, if anyone among you is suffering... Let him pray. If he's cheerful, let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. These two verses, James fires off three short questions with real crisp answers. These three questions, they run the gamut of life's experiences when you look at that. Pressure is suffering. Then you've got pleasure when we're praising and on life's mountaintop. Then you have pain, which is sickness. All suffering and all blessings come from God for his glory and for our ultimate good. It may not seem that way at the moment, but God has our ultimate goal in mind. So in every situation we must learn to live with a Godward, God dependent focus. So, these three things suffering. James's readers, when you think about it, in the context of this letter, they were suffering because of their Christian testimony. 
But the word suffering may refer to all types of struggle and hardship that we encounter in life. It could be spiritual or physical. It could be emotional, financial, relational. As we see, becoming a Christian does not provide you an exception and an exemption from trials, as we could say. We all have trials where we could put us in a corner and suck in our thumbs for days. We're not exempt from struggle. But if you're going through trials of any sort, here's James's answer. It's short and sweet. He says, pray. It's easy to sit here and agree, yeah, that's right, you know. But when you encounter difficulties, is prayer your first response? It's interesting. Yesterday at the bowling alley, I was kind of overhearing Diana talk, and since she was sharing some of her struggles this week, and she goes, then I was listening, and I prayed, and then I prayed, and then I thought about it, and I went back, and I prayed, and I prayed some more, and I prayed some, and then I, and I prayed, and I'm like, yes, yes. Now, many times, it certainly isn't maybe our automatic response to pray. If we left to the flesh, the automatic response to suffering is what James had warned us about, grumbling, complaining, or we, we throw a pity party. Why is everybody always picking on me? You know, we, we can get that way, right? Or maybe we question God by saying, why is this happening to me? I'm serving you. Why, why, why? But James counters all this with a single word. He just says, pray, pray. So when you get into a conflict with your wife or your children, do you shoot up a prayer? For wisdom and a calm spirit. You know when you want to explode at your son or your daughter. Had one of those moments earlier this week. And you went, oh, go on your bed. I can't. I don't want to blow this. The calm. Do you pray that you will be an example of godliness to your family? Do you ask God to check your anger if that's your struggle? Do you pray that each family member would grow in Christ through the difficulty? Not to avoid it, but use it for sanctification. You know, when, when you face a problem at work, do you silently send up a Nehemiah prayer? Now, remember when Nehemiah talked with the unbelieving king Artaxerxes about his request to go back to Jerusalem and build the walls. Between the king's response of him asking him what he wanted and Nehemiah's response, this is what Nehemiah 2.4 says. Nehemiah states, so I pray to the God of heaven. Between that response, he prayed. Now, it couldn't have been more than just like a, a, a help me, Lord, quick kind of prayer. But it shows that his knee-jerk response was to pray. And we can, we can go on and on. When your car needs repair, do you pray for the mechanic to do good work? We need one a couple of weeks from now. Uh, when, you, when you need medical care, do you pray for the doctor to have wisdom? When you, when you make a major purchase or you face financial problems, you pray for wisdom to be a good steward of the resources he's entrusted to you. When you gather with lost family members for the holidays, do you pray for opportunities for witness? I had experience a couple weeks back when we met for Mother's Day. I've got unsaved family members, and the, the vanity and emptiness of my family, it burdens me. Oh, God, bring life to them. In every situation of life, God sends problems so you learn how to respond and to depend on him in prayer. So remember, if you're suffering, pray. Then he goes on to talk about praise. The natural response of a joyful heart is to sing praise to God. But do you acknowledge those blessings? Do you respond to those blessings that God has given you? Do you acknowledge them or do you take them for granted? And we should purposefully take time to reflect and count your blessings so our hearts will be overflowing with praise and gratitude. Psalm 40, verse 3. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Your songs of praise are testimonies to the world that the living God you serve is alive and well. What song has he put in your mouth in the midst of your struggles or in the midst of your praise? 
James has the same advice for both the suffering one and the cheerful one. Take it all to him. In fact, the two commands, I like this, they, they could be reversed. Sufferers should sing also. And the cheerful should also pray. And these, these two extremes show that God does not expect us always to be bouncy and cheerful and upbeat. You know, you're going through cancer. How do you all praise Jesus? Oh, oh, oh. Even if it's, come on, be real. I'm barely hanging on, but I'm hanging on. I'm hurting, but I'm being fed by the prayers of my church family. Don't fake it. His directive to us is this. When you're down, pray. When you're cheerful, sing. And I'll echo John Piper's thought here, and he's saying that when you're down, you've got to fight for joy. Okay? Sometimes it's been a long time since we've had joy. And you've got to fight for it. One way to do it is, is through prayer. Sometimes when you're down, the only way to get out of it is to sing out of it. <laughs> to praise your way out of it. If you can't express it yourself, play some worship songs or a great hymn or something to lift up your soul. God's point, first point is in all of life, whether suffering or insufficiency, it should be lived with a Godward, God-dependent focus. So we have our suffering, we have our praising, and he focuses thirdly on sickness. He says if anyone is sick, that person should call on the elders or the spiritual leadership of the church to pray for him. James clearly set the initiative on that person in need. He says, let him or her call. Now the hesitancy of people to ask for or to seek prayer from the leadership of the church in such circumstances is kind of a mystery to me. Guys, don't hesitate to call on the leadership of legacy when you need prayer. It is our privilege and our blessing to do so. We are not burdened and bothered and kicked off by your coming to us. It's our joy and privilege. Please don't hesitate when you need prayer and encouragement. And then lastly, at the end of verse 14, he says, let, let them pray over him, almost a, kind of a connotation of laying on of hands, praying over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the anointing of oil, it's been interpreted as either seeking the best medical attention possible, or the afflicted, like oil massages, were considered medicinal in that time period, or as an emblem of the, the Holy Spirit's presence and power and ability to heal. The disciples anointed the sick with oil in Mark 6, 13, when we were sent out. That was a, a practice that they did. In fact, in Luke 10, verse 34, it mentions the application of oil in medicinal sense in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Poured wine and oil on the wounds of one Samaritan that was wounded. In fact, the efficacy of, of olive oil as a medical agent was well known in that time. It was abundant and it was used. So the, the word here for anoint is not the usual one in the Old Testament. It, it's more for medicinal meaning. It means to smudge and to smear and to apply. And so I'm not saying that you should all go out and buy essential oils. Uh, but if you need some, Don has about 855, I think, in, in our house. And so <laughs> there's an oil for everything, it seems like. I'm not saying that. But they were used for medicinal purposes in the Bible. So James says that it is the prayer of faith that heals, not the oil. But obviously it's not the prayer, but God to whom we pray who heals. Remember that. It's not the prayer. But God to whom we pray, who heals. So we're not talking about a ritualistic incantation. We're not talking about you do this and do this and God who has a genie will answer. It's still the God who is almighty that heals. And so we've talked about the first point. Now let's go to verses 15 and 16. James then shifts his focus to talk about how prayer is powerful and how confession brings healing. How confession brings brings healing. Our, our prayers of faith should believe in God's healing power, yet submit to his sovereign will. 
It's the myth. I put healing there twice to underscore the point. Healing and prayer of faith. He says in the prayer of faith, will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise them up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So the first question it kind of begs to ask is, what is prayer of faith? And, and is James actually guaranteeing healing in every case? Some resolve this by saying that the gift of miraculous healing was limited to the apostolic era. So it, so it doesn't apply anymore. While the gift of healing may have been for that period, that gift is not in view in these verses. And obviously, God can and does heal miraculously in every age when this is will to do so. Listen, God still heals, correct? Amen. We must believe in his power. But others go to the opposite extreme, and they say that it is always God's will to heal. And if you aren't healed, you must have it pray the prayer of faith. You just don't have enough faith. You didn't get it right. But the view is not only false, but listen, it's cruel. Yeah. It's cruel. If this were true, that no believer should ever get sick or die. Listen, are you going to you've got to follow the thread, right? If you if you've got victory over you just name it, claim it, and you're healed, then, then why are you sick and why are you dying? But that just doesn't square away with reality or in the New Testament. Remember, Paul was not healed of the thorn in his flesh. He prayed three times, and my grace is sufficient. And then Paul, who had healed others, left Trophimus ill at Miletus at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4. Why did he heal that? God's will always heal. Like, it just doesn't square away with reality and biblically. And eventually, we all sick, get sick and die. Timothy Keller passed away at the age of 72. He was a pastor and co-founder of the Gospel Coalition. Three-year battle with pancreatic cancer, which is pretty long and amazing, but he was a man of faith. And yet he died as well. Some argue that the, that the prayer of faith is, is a special subjective assurance that's given to the elders that God will heal in this situation. Like you get this, this, this sense, this power, this leading that, okay, this is one that's going to heal. But my, my problem with that, it's just, it can really easily be mistaken. I've had some things where I felt, oh, but then God's like, no. So, so you can give someone false hope that God will heal, but when he does not, you just add it again more to that person's misery. You said, you said. So how do we pray the prayer of faith? I believe we should pray for others in faith, expecting that God will heal them, but then we have to leave the matter into God's sovereign hands. Just let him work as he sees fit through the power of the Spirit. Clearly, God does not grant immediate healing for every prayer of faith. And the reasons are hidden in the heart and mind of God. And that we just bow. But still, many are not healed simply because there is no prayer of faith offered. Remember, the worst epitaph you should have is, we have not because you ask not. Don't just go, well, oh, well, whatever, doesn't matter. No, pray, pray, ask, believe. The best approach in praying for the sick is to pray with humble confidence that they will be healed unless God clearly and powerfully makes it clear that it is not his will. But having prayed, we simply leave the matter to God. Often, we do not pray in prayer of faith out of concern that God's reputation, if there should be no healing. But listen, God is big enough to handle his own reputation. Believe, pray, expect, but then lay it at the feet of our Savior and Lord. So not only is the first point about how we must pray in a powerful belief that God can heal according to his sovereign will, but confession should not be avoided, but it should be prudent. It should be prudent. He goes into verse 16, talks about the power of that confession to one another in the body of Christ is essential. 
It's important. Because sin will demand to have us to himself, and this is the key, isolated from everybody else. That's what the devil wants, to keep you away from the family and body of Jesus. But confession breaks the power of secret sin. Yet confession need not be to made to a priest or some imagined mediator. We simply confess to one another as appropriate. But confession is good, but we must have discretion in what we confess. I've seen examples of unwise confessions that actually would have caused a more sin and stirred more of the pot and created more wounds. So this, this word confess, it's the root form. It really means to say the same thing. So it means that in confession of sin, we agree to identify it by its true name and to admit that it is sin. You know, you see those interventions that you see on, on TV with family, and they just dance around. You're, you're praying, see what we all see. And admit and say the same, yes, I am addicted. Yes, I am abusive. Yes, I have. And that's the only part where we can begin healing. That's what confession is when you say, God, I see it. I say the same thing. I have sinned against you. And boy, there's power when we do that. Great conviction of sin and subsequent confession of sin was common during many spiritual awakenings. They went hand in hand. So public confession of sin has the potential for great good or bad. But here are nine principles from Pastor David Guzik that will help us in our confessions. And I believe this is important. The more we confess, and it's, it's, it hasn't been comfortably embraced in the church because it is, it eats at your pride. But I believe healing and oneness in the body, confession is a great avenue and it's biblical. But the first thing, confession should be made to the one sinned against. To the one sinned against. Most Christians have that preference for confession in secret before God, even concerning matters which involve other people. Well, God, I punched him. God, I stole from him. God, I lied to him. Forgive me. What about going back to the one that you stole or you punched or you lied to? You need to confess it to the one Syndicates. And many times it should often be public. The word confess your sins, actually in the wording of the original language, it means ones to others. Ones to others, not one to one other. It's not one to one, it's, it's, it's collective, it's corporate. Confessing many times should be public, but it should also be discreet. Often, confession needs to be no more than what is necessary to enlist prayer. Remember that. It can be enough to say publicly, pray for me. I need victory over a besetting sin that I have cultivated and had in my life for years. And then stop. Just... But it would be wrong to go into more detail. But saying this is important because it keeps us from being, uh, let's pretend Christians that everything is just okay. You're admitting you need help, and confessing that is healthy. Fourthly, we need to distinguish between secret sins and those which directly affect others. That's important. J. Edwin Orr wrote a book called Full Surrender, and he was an author that published many books that focused on spiritual awakenings in the history of various countries and various uh, movements, even in the spiritual awakening in the early 1900s. And he has a chapter on confession. And this is what he says on this point specifically. If you sin secretly, confess secretly. Admitting publicly that you need the victory, but keeping details to yourself. But if you sin openly, confess openly, to remove stumbling blocks from those whom you have hindered. Now remember that. If you sin secretly, confess secretly. Being publicly just that you need victory. But if you sin openly, confess openly to remove stumbling blocks. Because then you need to wonder, is that person ever repentant? I, I struggle with that. Where someone has made a public sin. And then they may get it right with God. But they never have come corporately. To show there's real repentance. 
And then you wonder, oh, they just got right back in leadership. Well, well what, how do we know their material future of their heart? It's important. Secret, secret. But public, we need to make sure that we are doing it biblically and well. And then confession needs to be made to people, but before God. It isn't that you confess your sin to God and, and others just merely kind of hear it peripherally. It's that you confess your sin before others and ask them to pray for you to get it right before God. There's power in prayer for one another. So when you confess before people, those people are lifting you up to give you victory over whatever is besetting you. And then sixth, confession should also be appropriately specific. Not so general. You go, I don't even know what, what to pray for. <laughs> I don't know what he's saying. Like, see the wisdom and the balance there? Specific, but not too much. Discretion, prudence. But say it. And then seventh, confession should be thorough. Many times they're not thorough. They are too general. They, they are not made of person's concern. They neglect completely the necessary restitution. You don't see that. Remember when you think of Zacchaeus and he, oh, he was full repentance mode. He's like, I want to give back and then some to try to make rest, to show his repentant life change. Do you sense that in a confession? Or do they make even no provision for a different course of how they're going to live their life? Are, are you seeing that the sin now is being forsaken? So it needs to be thorough for it to be real. And then that falls right into number eight, that it must have honesty and integrity. We confess with no real intention of battling the sin. Our confession is not thorough and it mocks God. It mocks God and his grace. The story is told of an old Irishman who confessed to his priest that he had stolen two bags of potatoes. The priest had heard the gossip around town and said to the man, Mike, I heard that it was one bag of potatoes stolen from the market. The Irishman replied, that's true, father, but it was so easy that I plan on taking another one tomorrow night. <laughs> so, by all means, guys, avoid phony confession. Confession without true brokenness or sorrow. If it's not deeply real, it isn't any good. Hmm. And then lastly, and this falls collectively on us, those who hear a confession of sin also have a great responsibility. Our proper response upon hearing the confession collectively is loving, intercessory prayer, and not human wisdom, gossiping, or sharing the need with others. We need to respect and be righteous. And then lastly, in verse 16, he says, the power of a righteous, or the prayer of a righteous person has great power. Much of our prayer is not effective simply because it's not, I love this word, fervent, earnest, intense. It's offered with a lukewarm attitude that virtually asks God to care about something that we care a little about. God, do this or do that. It doesn't move the heart of God because it doesn't even move your heart heart. Effective prayer must be fervent, not because we emotionally persuade God with our tears. He's reluctant to hear from us. He's not moved by that, but it's because we must gain God's heart by being fervent for the things he is fervent for. Getting in line with what his heart is, and then you pray earnestly for it. That's Powerful, effective prayer and is offered by a what kind of man or woman? A righteous person. It should be a humble prayer that is approached with integrity. This is someone who recognizes the grounds of his righteousness residing only in Jesus alone, but then whose personal walk is generally consistent with that righteousness he has in Christ. It's consistent. That's powerful prayer. So as we go into our outline, we see prayer is powerful. Confession brings healing. We need to be Godward and God-dependent, taking all our cares to him. And thirdly, then the pragmatic James gives us an example of answered prayer through the person of Elijah, the prophet. 
This is verses 18, 17 and 18. Although righteous, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He says it just straight up. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I'm the real, really clever point here, right? And he, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. But then he prayed again. And heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. As you read the story of Elijah, you find that in spite of seeking God, of seeing God work in miraculous ways, which he did, he became fearful and depressed. After seeing the victory of Mount Carmel, he starts running away from Jezebel. And he has a pity party in the cave. Oh, there's no one up there. There's 7,000 still have a me. But he's up and he's down. The point that James is making is Elijah was a great man, but he was, after all, just a man. We share the, the verse there of a nature like ours means in the, in the original language is like like passions. It's a common humanity where we're united to him. He had his ups and downs. We have our ups and downs, but he prayed and God answered. So even if you have your ups and downs, pray. The power of prayer is not with the man, but it's with our God that we pray. And then it says on, and then he prayed fervently. Again, the theme of fervent, earnest prayer. Elijah is an example of this kind of prayer. God Almighty answered it. The story of this drought and famine isn't from 1 Kings 17 and 18. James is reflecting back on this Old Testament narrative. But when James says that Elijah prayed fervently, the literal words there is that he prayed with prayer. He prayed with prayer. It's a Hebraism that, that signifies intensity, passion. The intensity of prayer because he was a man. Check out Elijah's back against the wall. He was against a godless king, facing a godless king and a godless queen. 450 of her are godless prophets and an entire nation that had turned its back on God. Now talk about being a rock in a hard place. So Elijah, being a man with a nature just like ours, in our common humanity, our like passions, he recognized, I am inadequate. But he also realized that God was adequate. The reason that we do not pray earnestly is we not properly see how weak and inadequate we are and how powerful the enemy of our souls really is. If we see that salvation is not just a matter of someone deciding for Christ. But rather of God opening his eyes through the power of the Spirit, convicting him of a sin, of righteousness and judgment, and raising him from spiritual death to life, we will pray more earnestly for lost souls. This isn't a, a debate to win. I would, I would have debated my cousins or my, my nieces for Christ if I could try to arm wrestle them with my mental acuity. I would try that. It's not this guy's. It's... God, wake up a dead, cold heart and infuse life from your spirit. That causes me to pray for God that only he can answer. If we are to abide in Christ because nothing we can do apart from him, then we must pray more fervently about every aspect of our lives. We are adequate, but God is all inadequate. All adequacy is in God. Someone has summarized how God answers different prayers. If the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If you are wrong, God says grow. When the request and the timing and you are right, God says go. And we've been in that no and the slow and the go. We all have. If you've earnestly prayed for God, you've seen his sovereign hand and how he answers our prayers. George Mueller was a rebellious Prussian young man whom God saved in his 20s. Mueller later founded an orphanage in Bristol, England. He was concerned about the needs of many prophets or many orphans whom he saw on the streets. 
But his primary concern for founding the orphanage was to demonstrate that God is still a prayer-hearing God and that it is not a thing to trust in him. George Mueller built five large orphan houses and cared for 1,024 orphans in his lifetime. 10,024 orphans in his life. He prayed in millions of dollars in today's currency for the orphans, and he never asked anyone directly for money. He never took a salary in the last 68 years of his life. The man lived like 93 years almost. But he trusted God to put in people's hearts to send him what he needed. He never took out a loan or went into debt, neither that he or his orphans were ever hungry. <laughs> Mueller and his new bride, Hillary, sold or gave away everything they had, owned, and gave the money to the Lord's work. Then they set about praying for God to provide for their own needs and the needs of the orphans. And I love this. His theme verse was Psalm 8110. Listen. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. <laughs> For over 60 years, he saw God faithfully provide for as many as 2,000 orphans at a time, all in response to secret prayer. Mueller never disclosed any needs to potential donors, even if they asked. He and his staff would pray and often see God provide the exact amount that was needed on the day they needed it. Mueller gave God all the glory by writing an annual narrative of how the Lord had provided once the needs had already been met. George Mueller fed 10,000 orphans in prayer. It's powerful and it's effective. Then lastly, as we finish up the message, he ends in verses 19 and 20 by calling us to be part of God's search and rescue ministry. This ministry requires both search and rescue, and it's the responsibility of all believers. It's our responsibility. It's your and mine together to search and rescue. Remember what he says. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings them back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James says that it is possible to wander from the truth. Today, more and more people say that doctrine does not matter. But listen, what we believe determines how we behave. It is possible for a believer to wander away from the place of sound doctrine or truth. And when we wander from belief, our behavior soon follows. We see that. We know that. James says someone then should bring him or her back. The responsibility of our calling is that. In our zeal to win the lost, we sometimes forget that we are also to win the saved. We have the responsibility, according to James, in these two verses, to bring them back, to call them to repentance, to turn and change their mind and go back toward God, calling them out of sin, calling them out of disbelief, and then we're to save them from death. We're trying to resuscitate them because they were spiritually separated from God. They're suffering from being away from his presence and blessing. They're in danger of the pit of hell. And then we're to cover a multitude of sins by extending grace and forgiveness that is solely found in Jesus Christ. That's the restoration that's beautiful when we call a sinner back to repentance. In this ministry of search and rescue, search is required because professing believers who fall into sin seldom stay with the flock. You realize that? Where have they been? One week becomes two weeks, becomes a month, becomes six months, becomes a year. Where are they at? We've got to go after them. If you know of someone who made a profession of faith, but who has dropped out of church, you need to go looking for him to find out what's wrong. Don't be passive. So that's the search part. And then the rescue is required because it is seldom that such strained persons find their way back on their own without someone to guide them. The enemy of our souls confuses their sense of direction or they're ashamed of what they've done and they need to be assured of God's forgiveness if they will repent and confess their sins. 
They also need instruction on how not to stray away again so they don't repeat the cycle and continue the process. They need someone who knows God and the way back to teach them God's ways to avoid and resist sin. That is you. That is me as Christ Christ. Remember David's declaration of forgiveness when he begins Psalm 32, saying, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. James concludes with the importance of search and rescue because this is exactly what he has endeavored to do in this challenging letter. To confront those who have wandered from a living faith and embraced a dead faith. He's endeavored to save their souls from death by demanding that they not only hear the word, but they do the word. Because living faith will always have its proof. Amen? So let's live a God word and God dependent life. Let's pray earnestly, fervently, intensely, if that's even a word, knowing that the God we pray to is powerful. Let's confess our sins together so that there can be healing and spiritual growth. Let's follow the example of Elijah in his close walk and trust with God and his expectation, listen, his expectation for answered prayer. And then finally, we all need to bear the responsibility of being a part of God's search and rescue ministry. May God give the glory for his great name. So let's spend about five, six minutes as we close answering one, two, three, or all five of these questions in your groups again. How has God motivated you the most to pray more? What has he used in your life that has been the impetus to get you to pray more fervently and earnestly? And if we're cheerful, shouldn't we pray spontaneously? How can we work at that spontaneous praise? How do we know which sins, if any, to confess publicly? These questions are on the back of the outline. And how can we pray in faith? In Mark 11, he says, if, if, if you believe, it will be accomplished. This mountain can be uprooted and thrown into the sea. If you believe without doubt, your sins, your prayers will be answered. How can we know that? When we don't know God's sovereign will in advance, how can we pray that? And then lastly, how can you know whether just to pray or when it's time to talk to that sinning person as a part of the responsibility of our search and rescue? So spend about five, six minutes, and then I'll close in prayer.
close our service this morning so thankful for the family of believers thank you that your word is living and active powerful you call us to be dependent on you to live our lives focused on you and keeping in step with your spirit we lift up acknowledging that you answer prayer that you call us to lay our burdens at your feet and, and we lift up Nick Johnson as he's now a couple days back on Friday, his past Friday was traveling over to San Diego for a three year station with Marines and I pray that you will protect that young man, that you would use him, you would guide him and may he keep hold of you through all the trials and the ups and downs of this station there in California. Bless Nick and may his family feel the prayer of our collective body as he serves our country. I also pray for his Marine friend, his ICU with damage to both sides of his brain from that motorcycle accident. You know every detail, but you are powerful to heal, and I pray you will heal him completely with no side effects, with no lingering pain. Heal him and use Nick to be a, a godly influence on his friend. Please bring healing. Father, as we were called to, to be a minister of, of restoration and reconciliation, we, we lift up the Dingman family. We need your power to work in their families' hearts and their minds. Be with each and every one of them to fall at your feet under your sovereignty and over your power and over your goodness, that they will heed Submit in humility, serve and love one another and bring reconciliation to their family. We pray for our unsaved loved ones, our co-workers and those that are apart that are stationed for hell. If you do not call them, so we are fervently, earnestly pray for those that are facing eternal separation from you. Help us to pray and share the gospel and live the truth. Draw them to yourself. Give them saving, everlasting love and grace and mercy. So guide us today as we go our separate ways on this Lord's Day, as we begin a new week, that we would be dependent, that we would be prayerful, that we would seek your face daily, knowing that you have a yoke that is easy and a burden that is light. And we give you the, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of reminders of announcements. We'll have our all-church prayer meeting coming up here in, in June, the first Wednesday of June. And then our men's prayer breakfast and our young's fun day on June the 7th. And so I'd like to end with a, um, a little benediction prayer from Ephesians chapter 3. It says this, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And may our God give all the glory, and the honor, and the praise, and the dominion forever and ever, and we say, amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful Lord's Day. Thank you. Just one thing, that most of the chairs just go back on this rack, and they can just be pushed out in the hallway. There's no, um, they're having a graduation today, so. And also just one quick correction. Uh, Jason said June 7th on the oh, Young right. Journey. It's the 17th. It's the 17th, just wanted to make it. Thank you. Yeah, June 17th. Yeah, I didn't have the date on me, and I looped it up. But thank you, yeah, that will be important.